In this video, we'll look at three ways to store data in the browser, including the Cache API, IndexedDB, and the Web Storage API, which lets you access local storage and session storage. Hey guys, and welcome to Zool Coding. To get started, I've set up some basic HTML and CSS for a simple user management app, which will help us walk through the different ways of storing data. All the code in this video can be found on the Azul Coding website, linked in the description down below. So let's start by looking at the first method, the Cache API. We've got a user interface here that displays a list of users in our database. We'll be using IndexedDB to store those a bit later, and we can also add a user on this row. There's a load sample data button here, and so let's use the Cache API first to fetch a list of users and cache their response, so we don't need to make the call again when the user refreshes the page. In this script, I've defined some constants and variables that we'll make use of throughout the video. I've also started by adding a getSampleData function that returns a promise. If you're not familiar with promises in JavaScript, check out this video on the channel. The Cache API is perfect for storing network requests. Because we use a URL endpoint as an ID, but there's nothing stopping you from caching any JSON object in here. In terms of storage capacity, it really depends on which browser we're using and how much storage we have available on our device. In any case, we can expect to store relatively large amounts of data. In our getSampleData function, we can use caches.match and provide the name of the endpoint for the user data. In this case, it's going to be users.json. Then once we've accessed the cache, we can use this callback to get the response from the cache. If we have one, that means the data has already been cached, and we can just resolve the promise and return the JSON. If not, we'll have to fetch the data like so, and get the JSON from there. If we get an error out of this, we'll update the status message, and I'll create a show status function to do this. And if we do get the JSON file correctly, we'll want to add that into the cache. To do this, we have to open a cache and give it a name. Then once we have access to that, we'll put the response into the cache with one line of code and then resolve this promise with the JSON. The reason I'm using a clone of this response is because once we read the response once, it'll return an error when we read it again on this line. So cloning the response will prevent this. Let's call this function in a click event handle I made down here and console log the result for now. Let's test it out. We can check to see what's in the cache using DevTools. And as you can see, there's nothing here at the moment. If I click on load sample data, we can see the data in the console. The cache has been loaded with the JSON object. And if we look at the network tab, the request was successfully made to users.json. If I refresh the page and click on the button again, we can see the data in the console, but this time no second request was made as the data was instead retrieved from the cache. Now we cover the cache API, let's move on to index.db. We'll use index.db to perform the majority of the actions in this user management app. So let's start off simple and update this counter up here to see how many entries we have in the database. In this update db info function, we'll start by performing a transaction to read the database like this, passing in a name, users in this case, and because we're only reading the number of entries, we'll be using read only. We'll then want to get the object store that contains the data from the transaction like so. And then we'll simply use a count function to get the number of entries. Unfortunately, this doesn't return a simple integer. We need to implement a quick callback function on success, at which point we can access the value in the result property here. Before we can test this, we need to load in some users. So let's see how we can load in those sample users from earlier. In the init database function here, I'm going to return a promise that will resolve to the database instance. We can use indexdb.open and pass in a database name and optional version. Then we need to use callback functions to check the result of the open request. If an error occurs, the on error callback will be fired. And so we'll update the status and reject the response to the error code. If the database exists and was read successfully, we'll assign our database instance to the DB variable, update the counter from earlier, and call load users, which we'll get onto in just a moment. And lastly, if the database doesn't exist yet, the on upgrade needed callback will be fired, at which point we can create an object store on the database. I pass in the name of the store along with some additional options. The key for each record in the database will be identified by the key path property, ID in this case. And because I've set auto increment to true, the database will automatically increment the ID of each record, so we don't need to worry about it. We can then create indexes for each property in our user record, one for the name, email, and age. And we can specify which values should be unique. I've set unique to true on the email field, so that no two users can add the same email. In the load users function, I'll first clear the container that we'll be adding the users to, and then perform a similar transaction to before, except this time we're using open cursor to loop through the values in the database. 
When this fails, we use an on error callback to update the status. And when it succeeds, we'll use the on success callback again to get the result. This callback will only be called once to begin with, and it'll contain the first entry in the database under the value property. We can then update the UI to add in that user as a new row like this. And then we'll call curse.continue to get the next item, when this callback will run again. Let's also call update db info here to get the count. I'll add the event handlers for the edit and delete buttons a bit later, but for now let's get the sample data loaded so we can see if it works. In load sample data, I'm now using the read write option to allow me to save the sample data to the database, and then looping through the sample users, putting each one into the database using the pot function. When we reach the end of the list, we'll call load users here. Let's call inner database down here, log in any errors like so, and then we'll test what we've got so far. If we take a look in the application tab in DevTools again, we can see that a users table has been created here. It's currently empty, so let's click on load sample data. That now updates the UI and I can refresh the table in DevTools, and that shows all the entries. Let's now add in the functionality to add, edit, and delete users. We can start by creating a generic save user function that will either add or update a user. It'll be set up in a similar way to earlier with a promise and transaction. And then if we have an ID in the user data parameter, that'll mean it's come from an existing record in the database. So we'll call the put function here. Otherwise we'll call the add function, making sure that there's no empty ID, otherwise the auto increment won't work. Then we can check for an error here using event.target.error this time. If the error name is constraints error, that most likely means that the email we provided already exists, because we set an email field's unique property to true earlier. And lastly, we'll want to return the successful result in the onSuccess callback. To add a user, we can create a new function and get the name, email, and age values from the input fields in UI. We'll then show an error if a name or email hasn't been provided. And otherwise, we'll call save user and either load the UI again with a new user added and the input fields cleared. Or show an error if the operation failed. Let's add the click event handler on the add user button and test it out. By adding another user and leave the age field blank, click in add user, and there we are, the new user was added with the age shown as not applicable in the UI. If I refresh the page, the data persists. Now when the user clicks on edit, we'll want to replace the text values in the row with input fields, so we can edit the user entry. I've created some new functions here. Start editing will be called when the user clicks edit, and that will change the buttons on that row to save or cancel which will call the following save edits and cancel editing functions respectively. So when the user clicks edit, we'll first want to make sure we have a user ID to work with. If we do, then we'll change the HTML of the row to include text fields like so, making sure to populate the current name, email and age values, along with the new save and cancel buttons. Then we'll apply the click event handlers to these buttons. In save edits, we'll get the values from the new input fields and populate a user object here. Then we'll call save user that we created earlier, making sure to load the UI again if the edit operation was successful. And lastly, when the user cancels the editing, we'll just reload the UI and set our global variable to null. While we're here, let's create a delete user function. We'll first bring up a confirmation dialog so the user can cancel if they want to. Then we set up the transactions before using the read write option. And then we need to call delete and pass in the user ID, along with the error and success callbacks. Don't forget to reload the UI if the process was successful. And lastly, we have a clear database button as well. This works in a similar way to the delete the user, but this time we're calling clear on the object store. Let's also add the edit and delete event handlers in load users, and also down below here. Let's test it out. I can click on edit and change the email address. And if I save that, the database is updated successfully. I can also cancel and edit like this, and delete a user with the confirmation dialog. And lastly, clearing the database works too. We'll now move on to the last method of storing data, which is the Web Storage API. The Web Storage API allows us to use local storage and session storage to store small amounts of data. I made a video on the differences between these two, so be sure to check that one out. But essentially, local storage will store the data beyond closing the browser, whereas session storage only keeps it for the current session. It's worth noting that there is a storage limit of 5 megabytes for both local storage and session storage, so it's more tailored to smaller data like app settings. Let's explore how we can use the Web Storage API to store the theme that the user has selected in our user management app. I'm using CSS properties to manage the theme, so that when the HTML root element has a light class, the colours of the background and text will change. 
In the toggle theme function, I'm going to toggle the light class on the HTML root element, which essentially adds the class if it's not there, or removes it otherwise. And then we'll use the local storage.setItem function, passing in the key and value. And for session storage, you can simply call session storage.setItem instead. Now when the app loads, we'll want to get the current theme value using getItem, which returns none if the value isn't present. And lastly, if the theme is set to light, we'll add our CSS class. Let's apply the click event handler on the toggle theme button and test it out. So I've clicked on toggle theme and the theme changes. If you check the application tab in DevTools, we can see the value has been applied. And if I refresh the page, the light theme is automatically loaded. If you're looking for some example apps that created a suite of desktop and Android apps that are all open source, and I've also made a language insight for 11 that's 100% free, check them both out in the description down below. Be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe to keep up to date with the latest from Azure Coding. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.